Welcome to God's Truth. I'm Dr. D. Todd Harrison as we continue to flood the world with God's truth. We welcome you here this day as we will teach and testify of Jesus Christ and the true gospel and the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. We welcome you today to see and listen, to sit and listen to the influence of the Holy Ghost. Teach your heart, teach your soul, teach your heart and mind, the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel plan. Today we're looking at 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19 as we will see what great the treasures are in store for us this day. All right, well let's look at uh, chapter 11 verses 2 through 8. And remember, uh, we get Jacob here uh, speaking in his great discourse. And he says, and now Nephi takes back over here. He says, and now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. For I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children. For he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. So Nephi it fits the prophetic model of being a prophet. You have to see Jesus. Uh, you have to see the Lord, as we learn in the book of Numbers. And he says here in verse three, and my brother Jacob also has seen him, as I have seen him. Wherefore I will send their words forth unto my children to prove unto them that my words are true. Wherefore by the words of three. So in this case, Isaiah, Nephi, and Jacob, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth even more witnesses than that. That's his basic law in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Yet God sends forth many other witnesses, and he proveth all his words. He doesn't want to just have you just take it by faith. He wants to prove to you that his words are true. And verse 2, we liked also about that he likens the words uh, to his, uh, you know, to his people. Uh, the scriptures are supposed to be lessons for us. So even when they're talking about Gideon, you know, or Amos, or whatever the case may be, we should be learning things from their lives and the lessons that God that taught us through them so that we can benefit thereby as well. Be behold, in verse 4, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ, boy, what great joy it brings. What great joy these past few years have been for me to continue to prove to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he has restored his truth, his church, and his kingdom upon the earth in these latter days. In preparation for his soon forthcoming return from the heavens, and all his splendor and majesty and glory to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. He says here, For this end hath the law of Moses been given, to, to prepare the people for the birth of Jesus Christ. And all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto men are the typifying of him. Everything that God ever did, everything that God ever showed to us was to prepare our minds, prepare our hearts to receive his son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our all. Verse 5, and also my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. How do you know someone is good hearted? How do you know someone is a true righteous person? How do you know that someone loves the Lord God? They love, as he says here, they delight in making covenants with him. And yet throughout the Christian world, there's so many denominations and so many millions of Christians who don't want to make covenants with the Lord. In fact, because they don't love Jesus, they don't delight it and make it covenants with him. They try to argue that you don't need to make covenants with God. But once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can live a, live a sinful life. You don't have to keep the commandments. And, and you will be fine and you will be saved because 
Their hearts are not pure. They're not righteous. They don't truly love the Lord Jesus Christ. They therefore make a mockery out of his atonement, out of his death and sacrifice for mankind. Of this, they must repent. He says here, Yea, my soul delighteth in his grace. Oh, we saw that last week too, huh? Grace being preached again in the Book of Mormon. And yet these same people who hate Jesus, they hate the biblical Jesus, they hate the biblical God, and they hate the biblical gospel. They're out there trying to deceive people and say that the church of Jesus Christ does not believe in grace. But yet we see grace being preached every week here in the Book of Mormon, don't we? And in his justice and power and mercy in the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. And my soul delighteth in proving unto my people that save Christ should come, all mankind must perish. That's it. Paul said, all man has fallen short, of, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If it hadn't been for Jesus, we're, we're all in big trouble, right? For if there be no Christ, there be no God. And if there be no God, we are not. For there it could have been no creation, but there is a God, and he is Christ. And he cometh in the fullness of his own time. And now I write some of the words of Isaiah, that whoso of my people shall see these words may lift up their hearts and rejoice for all men. Now these are the words, and he may liken them unto you and to all men. Verse 12, uh, chapter 12, here we go. One through three. This is parallel to Isaiah chapter two and Micah chapter four. A lot of people don't know that, but the same prophecy is in the book of Micah as in the book of Isaiah again. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So here's a significant prophecy about the future Latter-day temples. Therefore, it must needs be that another prophet prophesied of them well, as well, which Micah did prophesy of. Chapter 12, 1 through 3, or Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days, prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains, the rocky mountains, Utah, the tops of the mountains, the temple being built here in Salt Lake City, Utah, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And since 1847, that has been the case, that all nations have come to Salt Lake City to worship God. You can now, you can now for many years now, you have congregations in Spanish and Portuguese and Samoan and Tongan and in all the pretty much all the languages, you could go to church every week in a different language because these peoples have come to the tops of the mountains, to the Lord's house, to his temple in Salt Lake City to worship God as foretold and prophesied by Isaiah and by the prophet Micah. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, which they've literally done. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the, the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Uh, the Lord in the uh, second coming will have two capitals, uh, one in Jerusalem, as well as one in the, in the, uh, in the New Jerusalem in Jackson County, Missouri. We'll learn about that next year when we look at the Doctrine and Covenants. And 10 through 21. O ye wicked ones, enter into the rock, hide thee in the dust. For the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty shall smite thee. Oh, you talk a big game now, don't you? Oh, you like on the true church of Jesus Christ. Oh, you love to insult them. Oh, you love to make up rumors and false ideas about them to deceive people and lead them astray and to make sure that they don't join the truth and the true kingdom of Jesus Christ. The day is coming in which you're going to be hiding behind the mountains from the glory of that Lord who you spent your life 
fighting against. Hide thee in the dust, where the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty shall smite thee. And it shall come to pass that the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall soon cometh upon all nations, yea, everyone, yea, upon the proud and the lofty, and upon everyone is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Okay, moving on here in verse 21. To go into the, uh, in, in verse 20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he made for himself to worship, as well as the Trinitarian creeds of a false apostate, false non-biblical Christianity, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged mountains, for the fear of the Lord shall come upon them, and the majesty of his glory shall smite them when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from him, whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Chapter 13, 9 through 11. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And doth declare their sin to be even as Sodom, and they cannot hide it. Woe unto their souls, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. And so it is with the wicked. When you, if, if you live close to the Spirit of God, so you have the Spirit with you, you can judge people by their countenance, whether they're righteous or whether they're wicked. Wicked, their countenance shows, shows forth their true uh, uh, void that they're truly void of light and the light of God. Verse 10 Say unto the righteous that it is well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. Woe unto the wicked, for they shall perish, for the reward of their hands shall be upon them. Chapter 14. Uh, verses 1 through 6. And in that day, so now they're talking about a great war coming forth in which a lot of men will be killed off prior to the return of Jesus Christ. And in that day, seven women shall take hold on one man, saying, we're willing to enter into a polygamous marriage with you. We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. You don't have to provide for us. Only let us be called by that name to take away our reproach. We don't want to continue to be single woman. We just want to have uh, to be married to somebody, a faithful priesthood holder, and we want to have children, and we will take care of ourselves and provide for them, right? In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, the fruit of the earth excellent, and ca uh, calmly to them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion and remain in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall purge the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Are we ready? Are we ready now? Again, it's difficult when we look at these verses, right? Because with just being online, right? We don't have the established class where people are coming, you know, each time, right? We got people coming and joining all the time. And so well, we've had two years, two years of looking at all the biblical evidence of all these uh, of the hundreds of passages as we continue through all this, you know, looking at several other principles in, in the Old and New Testament. We've looked at these issues hundreds of times now, right? So. Those of you who have been with us are well prepared for these kinds of things. Others of you may be joining for the first time, and you've had no idea what the scriptures really teach about a pretty, a pretty important subject right now that the, the, even the United States Congress is spending millions of dollars investigating now about these unidentified flying vehicles. Now they want to be called... Uh, 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 you know, uh, UAPs, right? Rather than UFOs, UAPs, uh, you know, I think it's something like uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. Uh, but uh, we've been looking at this stuff for the government uh, uh, now and, and 
Congress and even open testimony now uh, for the last few years. And and, uh, and we've looked at all these passages in the Old and New Testament about these things. And so here we go. Now, again, uh, remember what we got here is we're getting this from Isaiah chapter 4. So we're going right back to the Old Testament, uh, more of these uh, um more more on this subject but here we go are you ready here we go and the lord will create upon every dwelling place of mount zion here we go powerful coming up here and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night for upon all the glory of zion shall be a defense and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and a covert from storm and from rain. Did you catch that? Did you catch that, right? We looked at this hundreds of times in the Old and New Testament. The people in the Old Testament, they don't know the word airplane. They don't know helicopter. They don't know hot air balloon. They don't have any of this vocabulary. So generally, they describe these things as what? Like in Moses, right? A cloud, right? They look like these silvery objects. Just like today, we have millions of people witness these things around the world. These flying clouds, right? <laughs> these these cloud-like looking gray uh, objects, right? So cloud by day, and it has lights on it. They don't know the word lights, right? They know fire, but they don't know lights, right? And lights by nine. That's why it's shining of a flaming fire by night. For what? For a defense. Again, if, if his holy people, did you catch it? He's going to have these UFOs everywhere, wherever his chosen people, Mount Zion is. He's going to have a bunch of these UFOs everywhere ready to fight and defend his saints, the saints of God. We saw in, uh, in Psalm uh, 68 that God had over 20,000, over 20,000 of, of these flying objects, and that was back, uh, you know, in the days of David. We're talking, you know, 3,000 years ago. If, they, if they've been building more since then, they could have far more than 20,000. But at one time they had at least 20,000. Uh, 20,000 in Hebrew, though, can often just mean an infinite number. It could just be a, you know, really big number. It didn't have to actually mean exactly 20,000. So it might have been way more than 20,000 then. could be way more than 20,000. Uh, now, but there's a powerful imagery here that the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion. These clouds by day and pillar of fire by nights, right? To defend, for upon all the glory of Zion shall be a defense, right? Ready to fight and destroy anything that poses a threat to his saints in the last days. Powerful, powerful verse of Scripture, powerful vision that the prophet Isaiah had here in chapter 4 of Isaiah, chapter 14 of 2 Nephi. Okay, chapter 15, 20 through 30. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Boy, do we see that every day in the newspapers in today's society, right? They've taken what it was generally and historically called evil and have actually tried to promote it and actually make it to be a good thing, right? The judgments of God are coming upon those who engage in such activity. 21, woe unto the wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto the mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. And we looked at that the last two years in the scriptures as well. It's not just some peculiar thing that the Church of Jesus Christ does by not drinking wine and strong drinks. That was always the biblical law. That was always the biblical counsel all the way through. Here again, Isaiah chapter 5, uh, you know, and quoting here that about the woe, un woe unto the mighty to drink wine and the men of strength to mingle strong drink. Just don't do it. 23, who justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, 
and the flame consumeth the chaff, their root shall be rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. Again, the biblical God, the biblical Jesus, not the false one being preached in society today. Boy, we've taught this principle hundreds of times the last few years, haven't we? And he's talking about who here? The members of his church, right? We continue to see today the members of the church of Jesus Christ. So some of them are really becoming quite wicked and very liberal in their uh, in their beliefs that they don't even have a testimony of the current prophets anymore. They don't even have a testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith or the restoration of the church. They just come as some sort of social club. They just think they just come to church as a social club, and, and but yet they're not with the program. They don't have the testimony. They don't have the intellectual intelligence to understand the scripture. Part of that is their own fault because they rest the scriptures and don't actually read them. But here it, uh, here it says what's going to happen, right? And we saw this in hundreds of verses of Scripture in the Old and New Testaments. When Jesus comes back, the first thing he's going to destroy are the wicked people of his church. He cleans his own house first before he starts to destroy those who never did join his house. Let's read this language again. The real Jesus, the biblical Jesus here. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, his people the members of his church. And he has stretched forth his hand against them and has smitten them, and the hills did tremble as they're running away from him when he comes back. And their carcasses, here we go, the true Jesus, were torn in the midst of the streets. He's going to allow their bodies to just be torn, or, torn apart. Their dead carcasses torn apart in the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away. And even when that happens to the wicked members of his church, he's still going to be angry. <laughs> the real Jesus, not the false one that just, oh, he just loves this wicked group. And he loves that wicked group. And he's just so tolerant. Just love, love, love. That's not Jesus Christ. That's not the Jesus of the Old Testament. That's not Jesus of the New Testament. That's not Jesus of the Book of Mormon. That's not Jesus of the Doctrine and Covenants. That's not Jesus of reality. His anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from afar, and he will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary, nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the lash of their shoes be broken whose arrows shall be sharp, and their bows bent, and their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind, their roaring like a lion. They shall roar. So again, we're going right back. He's, he's trying to describe these UFOs coming back with Jesus. We're told that they're coming back. We're told that in the Bible, for example, you know, they're described sometimes as what? Angels riding horses. We know that horses don't fly through the, through the midst of heaven, through the midst of the skies, and they certainly don't have angels riding horses flying in the in the midst of the air, right? No, they're coming back on these UAP, these UFOs. They're going to be shooting missiles and things at the people, right? Yeah, Isaiah has no idea how to describe it, so he's doing his best here. That they're hor that they sound like horses' hoofs. You know, it's going to be making noises. These machines and their wheels. They got wheels, right? Like whirlwind, and they're roaring. Their engines sound like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. They shall roar and lay hold of the prey, the wicked, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver. And in that they they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea and that they look unto the land behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof right okay 
chapter 16, the throne room, the famous throne room. Recently had been a popular song the last couple of years about the throne room. Pretty powerful uh, song. And so we'll look here at the throne room of Isaiah in uh, the parallel to Isaiah chapter 6. We get it here in 2 Nephi chapter 16. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, right? And so it is with tragedy, right? Oftentimes in uh, periods of national or personal tragedy, that's the time we see the Lord. That's the time we see the Lord's blessings poured out upon us. Not when things are going well. When things are going bad, when your king dies, right? To when a family member uh, pass on, when when any number of the, the things like that happen, then your eyes shall be open. Then you turn to the Lord enough that you can witness these uh, spiritual things. Above us stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. Twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the pulse of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke, representing the glory of God. Then said I, Woe is, on me, for, woe is unto me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues uh, from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity has taken away, Isaiah. And thy sin, Isaiah, has been purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and here we go, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, Isaiah, send me. Powerful, right? Those of you who, who know the, the, the Pearl Grey Price, for example, knows that in the pre-mortal world, the father presented his plan and that it would entail someone coming down and suffering upon the earth and being crucified and suffer all these horrible things to die for the sins of the world. And what happened? Jesus stood forth, here am I, Father, send me, right? He stood up, right, and did that, right? Where was Isaiah at that time, right? But the important thing is, Isaiah and everybody else, right? But the important thing is Isaiah learned. Here was his chance. This is like a Peter moment, right? Peter denies Jesus, knowing Jesus, who Jesus Christ is at his trial. So Jesus comes back and three times, for the three times he denied knowing Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ asked him, do you love me, Peter? Feed my uh, sheep and lambs, right? Three times to reverse that, right? Here he is. Who shall I send, Isaiah? Stand up this time. Say, send me. And Isaiah did this time, didn't he? Didn't do it in the pre-mortal world. But now Isaiah stood for, here I am. Send me. May we all learn that lesson. May we all go forward. And when God says, who shall I send? We shall say, here am I. Send me. Verse 9, and he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but they understood not. And see indeed, but they perceive not. You go preach the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to the wicked. They're not going to understand it. They're not going to embrace it, right? Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and be converted, and then I need to forgive them and heal them. And I said, Lord, how long should I preach? 
And he said, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And so it is with some of you missionaries out there who are who are struggling or who are struggling to find people who you can teach the gospel to, struggling to uh, meet uh, baptismal uh, goals, for example, right? How long should you keep working hard and preaching the gospel? Until the end of your mission or until this thing happens, right? That the, the cities are wasted without inhabitants, right? So you have no excuse. Go forward, work hard, and continue to preach the gospel with all your might. One day, so you'll find out something good came out of it. You may not know. They may not accept the gospel the first time or the second time or the third or the fourth. But one day, they may join the church, and they may always be grateful to you for being the one to plant the seed within them that sprouted eventually to full conversion to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's that there. And now we go to chapter 17. I think we're going to go ahead and skip chapter 17 at this time. Again, we are trying to when we teach these gospel lessons, we listen to the Spirit of God and we try to make our best determination what the Spirit's telling us. And we will go forward and um, this is called God's truth. We continue to teach God's truth. Right? We're not going to ever lie. We're not going to ever distort truth, even if it's for a good purpose, trying to build faith, trying to build testimony. We are here to teach God's truth. There's something here in Isaiah chapter 7 that a lot of people are familiar with, but it's just not accurate. There's already enough evidence and enough prophecies of Jesus Christ throughout scriptures that we don't need Isaiah chapter 7, right? This has long been misquoted, misinterpreted by the church, by the Christian church throughout the last 2,000 years. It was a great experience in the life of Isaiah and his spouse and his kid and the, and the, uh, and the you know, in the southern kingdom of uh, Judah. But we've misinterpreted this and taken it to refer to Jesus Christ which it does not. We've got other great prophecies, so we don't need Isaiah chapter 7. But there's great things here showing that God fulfills his prophecies. He prophesies through prophets, and he fulfills those prophecies just as prophesied by them. In chapter 17, we have a great war going on between Ephraim, or the northern kingdom, this is when you have the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, two separate countries now. They split off with the death of Solomon. Ephraim joins, or the northern king of Israel joins in confederacy with the, king, with the kingdom of Syria, and they come and they, and they fight against southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom of Judah are in the area of Jerusalem, the headquarters are worried that they might be defeated by Israel and by Syria, right? So God here basically tells uh, Isaiah, okay, go meet the king. Here we go. Let's see. He says, uh, he, he, goes, he goes and he meets uh, Ahaz here. Uh, Isaiah goes with his son. Uh, he says, um, Let's see, since, uh, in verse 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and share just of thy son. So sends Isaiah and his son to go meet King Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Okay, so then he says here, and he's talking to Ahaz now, 
And verse 10, moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, so through Isaiah, Isaiah speaking on behalf of the Lord, Ahaz, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it in either the depths or the heights above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Remember, a wicked generation, an adulterous generation, seeketh for a sign. He knows that. So he's trying not to seek for a sign. And he said, <coughs> excuse me, I need to, some water here for a minute. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to worry men, but you will you worry my God also? Here we go. Therefore, King Ahaz, the Lord himself shall give you, King Ahaz, a sign. Right? Here we go. I'm sorry, Christianity. <laughs> you mis totally misinterpreted this verse of scripture. This is a sign very clear to Ahaz concerning his enemies, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, which translated in Hebrew as a young woman. A young woman shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Not Jesus Christ. Here we go. Ahaz, right? Ahaz, you're going to witness this, right? But when honey shall he eat, he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before this child being born, you know, 700 plus years prior to Jesus Christ, for before, before this, the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, which we know to be age account about eight years old. The land that thou abhorrest, the northern kingdom of Israel, shall be forsaken of all three kings. So the land that thou abhorrest, Syria and uh, northern king Israel, shall be forsaken of both her kings. We know this happened in 722 BC when Assyria came and conquered northern kingdom of Israel. So in 730 BC, God saying through prophet Isaiah, Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be, uh, call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And before he shall know to choose the evil, and refuse the evil and choose the good when he's eight years old, from 730 to 722 B.C., northern Israel shall be forsaken of his king as well as Syria. The ten tribes will go off and be called the lost tribes of Israel uh, forever after that. God had warned them over and over, Israel, if you don't repent, if you don't forsake the false Im images, false idols, come back to the true God, I will bring in a foreign nation to conquer you. And he did. So that's what he did here. I don't know how they ever came up with the idea that this was a prophecy of Jesus Christ. We already have a lot of prophecies of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. We don't need to just try to grab anything and try to force it into a prophecy, which is not. It's very clear when you pay attention to what's going on. This happened in 730 and in 722 BC, before the child knew to refuse the evil and cling to the good, Assyria was destroyed, right? Now, it's going to be even more clear in just a moment here, too. Uh, but anyways, so there we got it. Okay, so now. Go to chapter 18, 1 through 4. Moreover, the word of the Lord said unto me, Isaiah, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen <coughs> concerning Maher Shalal Hasbaz which means destruction is imminent. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. Here we go. And I went unto the prophetess. Now we know that's a euphemism for sex. I went in and had sex with a prophetess. 
And she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, call his name Maher Shalal Hazbaz. For behold, the child shall not have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, before the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria, the northern kingdom capital, shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So he goes and fulfills this prophecy of chapter 7 of Isaiah, chapter 17 of Second Nephi, about the virgin conceiving and bearing a son. And before he could refuse the evil and choose the good, Assyria would be destroyed. So here it is, the fulfillment of this in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 8, or 2 Nephi chapter 18. Okay, very good. But now don't, don't you know, stay with us here, because we're about to get a great prophecy of Jesus Christ, the, the true prophecy of Jesus Christ from Isaiah here. Okay, so let's see here in the... Uh, five and eight, and then um, let me just check if anything else here in chapter 18. Okay, I think that's good here in 18. We encourage you, just because we don't cover some verses here in our lessons, doesn't mean you're exempt or excused from not reading them. We'd still prefer you to read this whole lesson and, and be benefited and pray spiritually. For God to open your eyes and your mind as you read it so you can be blessed and you can have your testimony increased and your faith in God increase as you read these things. Here we go, chapter 19. We get a great prophecy of, of Jesus Christ. This becomes part of the great uh, uh, Handel's Messiah. And here we go. So chapter 7, Isaiah, unfortunately, the virgin, not Jesus Christ. Uh, but. Chapter 9 of Isaiah, powerful prophecy of Jesus Christ. Here we go. 19, uh, this, compare, compare, so 2 Nephi chapter 19 and Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. Where was that? The Galilee area, right? And afterwards did more grievously afflict by the way the Red Sea beyond Jordan and the Galilee of the nations. The people that had walked in darkness have seen a great light, right? They were often uh, being overrun and, and being mixed in with different Gentile peoples, Gentile nations, leading them after their gods. So they walked in darkness. They've seen a great light because Jesus is going to spend his life there in Galilee. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of Death, with a lot of military conquests of Galilee. Upon them hath the light shine. Thou hast multiplied the nation and increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Here we go. Verse 6. Handles Messiah. For unto us a child, Jesus Christ, is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government was not upon the, the son of the virgin in, you know, chapter, uh, in chapter 7, right? The government's upon this child. This Jesus Christ, God's government, is upon him. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. None of this applied to the, the virgin's daughter in Isaiah chapter 7. This here. And chapter 9 of Isaiah is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, of the increase of government and peace, there is no end. Upon the throne of David, Jesus was a direct descendant of King David, 
and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What a mighty, wonderful prophecy of the coming forth of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Of him we testify to the world. He is the everlasting Father. He is the mighty God. The government of God is upon his shoulder. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever. What a great lesson again here as we continue to come unto Jesus Christ through the words of the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. What a great lesson has it been. For those of you interested, you can also watch our Come Follow Me uh, uh, Isaiah lessons and get more of this in, in detail. Uh, there as well that we gave a couple years ago when we did the Old Testament. For those of you not yet members of God's kingdom upon the earth, God's church, uh, we welcome you and we invite and extend to you a special invitation from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He loves you. He desires to welcome you to his house as a guest, as a permanent guest, and in fact as an adopted spiritual son. All he asks you to do is to come unto him, to repent of your sins, to exercise your faith in him, to accept him as your Lord and Savior in your life, to come unto the waters of baptism by those who actually hold the authority and the priesthood of God, those who are his authorized servants, those of whom he recognizes when they baptize somebody on the earth, he will count it in the heaven. He then desires to bless you immediately by granting to you the great gift of the gift of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit or paraclete or helper, however your Bible translation has it. That will be a constant help and support and comforter to you throughout your life and to lead and to guide you in the paths of righteousness and back on the path leading back to your Heavenly Father in his mansions above. Just reach out to the missionaries of the church. We will leave in the description of this video a link. Just click on and let the missionaries know that you would like to welcome, be welcomed aboard and would like to come unto the Lord and his church. For those of you who have fallen in activity in the church, we welcome you with full open arms to come on back. Come on back to the saints and the community and the church and the kingdom of God, the mighty everlasting kingdom, the mighty father, the prince of peace. Reach out to your local leaders. Reach out to the missionaries. Reach out to the members. Reach out to somebody and grab their arm and say, help me come back. And they will do everything they can to help you become one once again with the saints and community of God. And closing, once again, we ask God's blessings to be upon you, that you may have good health, that you may have safe shelter overhead, that you may have clean water to drink and food to eat to nourish your bodies and give you the strength. We bless you with basic financial resources, sufficient to carry out God's will and his mission for you in your lives. We bless you to have the courage to be a good example to fellow believers and to those who are not believers, so that by seeing your good example may want to inquire of you for the reason and the hope that's within you. We testify of the truthfulness of the things we've discussed this day. These things are the word of God and the power of God unto salvation. We believe God's blessings with you. We love you. We pray for you every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.